This is our 15th showcase, uh, and I uh, appreciate many of you that have come to these in the past. Anybody have any idea why we hold it um, this week in March? Is it? Yes, she remembers it's World Water Day week. World Water Day is the 22nd every year, and we, as best we can, attempt to hold our water showcase on the Tuesday of World Water Day. Uh, the event is organized through a collaboration between the PG&E Pacific Energy Center, this facility, the U.S. Green Building Council, the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, East Bay Municipal Utility District, and the Committee on the Environment for the local chapter of the American Institute of Architects, which brings me to a detail we'll bring up here. We have continuing education credits for these sessions. The number on the screen is the credit um, or the number to get the CEUs for the U.S. Green Building Council. If you would like those credits, you might write that number down. There is another number for those of you interested in, I guess I'll pause there, for the people interested in the AIA CEUs, which is there at the bottom of the slide. So one of the questions we typically get is, okay, love the sessions, but would have liked to have attended all 12 sessions. How do I get the materials from the other sessions? Uh, they'll all be posted on the event webpage. Um, if we can get them all edited quickly, it'll be next week, if not the week after. So we're videotaping, um, or a video recording, I should say, the video feed and the audio for every session. We're gonna uh, convert the presentations to PDFs and make those available as well. Uh, so look for that. Um, we'll send a notice out when they're posted. We'll also have a survey monkey, which is our way of getting feedback on the event. Um, some of the best sessions we've planned in the past and this year were based on feedback from our attendees. So if, you've, if you have a topic you'd like to have presented, please uh, note that. Um, it's actually good that you take notes on the events. You are better able to fill out the survey monkey after the event. Uh, I mentioned CEU's door prizes at 5.30 today. Uh, many of the vendors donated products and resources that we'll be giving away. So you have to fill out this little passport card that you were given when you, wa when you walked in today. And uh, again, the drawings are at the end of the day, but you have to be present to win. So keep that in mind. Uh, other details. So um, for egress for this room, the way I'd like you to exit this room, Obviously, we have the two doors in the back. Once you're out the door, you can go to the right and actually exit out the back of the energy center, or you could go through the front and, and exit on Howard Street. So in case of a fire, take the shortest path. Uh, what we'll do in case of a, a fire or like emergency is we'll meet at the corner of 4th and Howard Street. So I'd like you to either you exit out the back or exit out the front and make your way to that location. Uh, there's a carousel there. We won't ride it. We'll meet there. Uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with the location of the carousel at 4th and Howard. So follow these good people if you're unfamiliar with that location. Uh, I'll meet you there and we'll determine if it's safe to continue uh, the class. Um, and we're going to exit um, except under one specific emergency type. And because you're um, good Californians, you know not to exit the building in case of an earthquake. What you're going to do is duck and cover, wait for the building to stop shaking. And again, I'll determine if it's safe to continue the session. Uh, we've already sort of dealt with the lunches, but if you have anything biodegradable, please put it in the right container. And if you could silence your cell phones, that would be great. If you get a call, please take it out of the classroom. So uh, let me find my notes on our session. So have you enjoyed the session so far? It's been a good day? Good, good, good. Uh, let's see. All right. So we have uh, three speakers on this panel. And what we're going to try to do as I've said, is take your project-specific questions at the end. So our speakers are going to be on a pretty tight agenda here. Um, and we have three speakers. So we'll start with Dan Glusenkamp. He's with the California Native Plant Society. Uh, Dan works with staff and chapters to protect, understand, and celebrate California's native flora. He first fell in love with California plants and the California Native Plant Society as a student at UC Santa Cruz. And he has earned a PhD at UC Berkeley studying the ecology of native and invasive thistles. He previously worked as executive uh, director of the Cal, uh, sorry, Cal Flora database, where he led uh, development of exciting new tools for conservation and research, and as director of habitat protection and restoration for the Audubon Canyon Ranch 30 preserves. And there are many more qualifications, but I'm going to keep things flowing here. So Jennifer DeGraff is a landscape architect. Um, she's also QL rated and is the lead instructor for the Rescape Bay Friendly Coalition. 
Uh, she has 20 years of professional experience in design and project management for a number of project types, including parks, schools, hospitals, trail systems, streetscapes, historic properties, commercial housing, uh, and estates and private residences. Um, she's an instructor at UC Berkeley, which I didn't note, and I did acknowledge the Rescape training. So she's a trainer in many different areas, and she helps teach a class for us here at the Energy Center on the Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance. So look for that. It's a class we hold uh, at least once a year. And then Stuart Winchester, who's trying to hide in the back. Uh, Stuart is there. He is with Merritt College and Devil Mountain Nursery. He has 18 years of consulting with landscape architects and 40 years as an environmental horticultural instructor. So help me welcome our speakers. for taking up your time on this. So um, I get to work for the California Native Plant Society. I like it. It's a membership organization of 35 chapters around California and Baja California, Mexico, with about 1,000 volunteers who get all the work done, and I just get to talk about it. So that's, how many folks here have worked with native plants? All right, very good. I was going to ask how many people plan to or want to, but I, that's probably superfluous. How many people will never do it again? Okay, well, I'll, I'll try and make sure that I don't lose you in the course of this. So I want to start off by thanking Kristen Warren, who put together this beautiful presentation, to talk about some of what we're doing at California Native Plant Society to try and promote, promote restoring nature one garden at a time. And we want to support you in the work that you're doing so that native plant gardening and all the benefits that come with it will become the new default. So that when Home Depot is rolling out a new parking lot landscape, of course, they just put in those native plants that save water, reduce waste, and benefit pollinators. So that's where we're heading. And we're making fast progress, considering that 50 years ago, if you were to talk about your native plant garden to your neighbors, you'd get, you know, what, what are you even talking about? And now, now we're seeing native plants being promoted by water districts and municipalities, and, um, and things have really changed. And the next step of making it the default is not at all unreasonable. And I think that together we're all going to be able to get there. Sorry, Jen, I have to interrupt. Raise your hand if you have an open seat next to you. Raise your hand if you're not willing for a pers person to sit next to you. No one raises their hand, so please take those seats. There's so many open seats. Scooch over. Just everybody take scooch in. We all know how to evacuate we're fast. To welcome these people in these seats. Thank you. OK, so. In, uh, so to talk quickly about why we're all here today, we're here for water conservation. Forget that it's raining out there. Um, and native plant garden, native plants, excel at water conservation. And so that is a really important part of what we're doing. Um, sorry, I moved on too swiftly. But just to give you a few little factoids, um, you know, one example of it that you've probably all heard about is that City of Santa Monica project where they did a nine-year study comparing two gardens. And they used it to determine the inputs and outputs of different gardening strategies. The native plant garden used 83% less water, produced 56% less yard waste, and it required about two-thirds the maintenance of the other garden. And so, you know, that is, those are the multiple benefits of doing a native plant garden. And excelling water is much, or saving water is much of what is driving the adoption of native plant gardens. But there's other reasons, and reasons that those of us in CNPS working on this uh, really care a lot about. Native plants are really the foundation of ecosystems. And when you think about what California was 200 years ago, 500 years ago, 100 years ago, um, people, you know, I know people whose granddads had cows in cow hollow. There was a lot more landscape for the things that we value, for the other things that we share this planet with, and that we depend on to produce clean air and clean water. Today, they have few places to live. And we can bring some of those places back. 50% of California is private land, much of that in the cities especially, is, is, is subject to being gardened. And if we garden, if we improve our gardening practices and improve our design, we can bring a lot of those things back in, stabilize populations of pollinators and birds and animals that we care about. We can bring nature back into our homes where we can be nourished by it, um, and we can help make the earth a more stable and survivable place. So just to talk about that stuff for a little bit before I get into garden design. I just want to give you some more factoids. We're kind of we're buzzing about this stuff in the wake of the big CNPS conference that we did in LA about a month ago, where Doug Tallamy came and spoke. And some of you probably are familiar with his work. 
Um, he's a big proponent of gardening to produce insects. He started life as an entomologist, became, became interested in the plants those things were eating, and then learned how that interaction, plants that can be eaten by insects, is fundamental to supporting all of us. Keeps, keeps ecosystems healthy, it feeds birds, and ultimately it keeps hu humans alive. Um, reduces abundance of disease organisms, all kinds of good things. This is, plants are critical in this. Something on the order of 90% of the insects that you find eating native plants um, are host specific. And, and so when we provide those hosts rather than just generic plants, um, we can do a good service. Moreover, it's important for conservation. California is a special place. Uh, as you can see on this slide, California has more plants. We have more plants native to California than any other state in the union. We actually have more rare plants in California than most states have plants. California is an important place globally, not just for flower tourism, but it's a biodiversity hotspot. We've got about 35 biodiversity hotspots in California, California's, or in, on the planet Earth. California is one of them. So when we do good for California's flora and the creatures that depend on it, we're doing the world a favor. Um, and just to quickly show you some of this, um, you can see this shows endemism. The blue stuff, the, basically you got a heat map where red is very low species richness and uh, blue is very high. And as you can see, there's, there's much of the country that isn't very lucky. No place is as lucky as California. We've got incredible biodiversity, incredible species richness. We have a magical flora that is huge, special, gives us a lot of good potential garden plants, a lot of opportunity for doing change, and a lot of reason to do it. So just to quickly talk about you know, what, what we plant matters. As you can see, the system that you see on the left of your screen is kind of a generic garden. It looks nice. Um, to a certain degree, it might as well be AstroTurf. Those plants are not being eaten by anything but maybe a cutworm here and there. Um, they're not supporting the local food web. In many cases, they're not drought friendly. On the other side, you can see the beautiful, wonderful native plant garden, which is, if it's designed correctly, is drought friendly, reduces waste, reduces all matter of inputs, and supports the ecosystem. So at this point, I think we all are privileged enough to live in a world where we can, we can ask more of our gardens than maybe we could have 100 years ago. And these are some of the things that we can ask of our gardens. We obviously want them to support life, not just a few pretty flowers, but we like gardens that buzz a little bit. We like to see the butterflies, and we like to see the birds. We can have fancy elite gardens, not just utilitarian ones. We want our gardens to sequester carbon and help keep the air clean and fight climate change. We want to clean water. We want to manage water abundance. We want our soil fertility to be increasing, not decreasing. We don't, we don't want to lose the productivity of the land. Um, and, and as I've said throughout, we want to support pollinators. And this is a time of pollinator crises um, for many reasons. One reason is that the plants that they depend on have been removed and haven't been replaced. And so I'm glad that you guys, you know, in that show of hands, it looks like almost everyone is working on replacing those plants that benefit the pollinators. And hopefully, hopefully by the end of the day, you still will be. Okay, so that's the nice stuff. Just to get honest about it, there are some good reasons why the world isn't covered with native plant gardens. Um, some people don't use some people don't use natives um, because of uh, common perceptions. There's a perception that they are difficult to water, and they are difficult to water. Um, many of your typical mow and blow landscapers will be overwatering these things, treating them the way you would an English garden, and that's that's toxic to some of these drought-adapted plants. And so overwatering is a, is a common problem with these gardens, and it's tough to retool and not water. That's kind of crazy, but, but if you can do it, you have better survival. Um, because of overwater and other factors, many times the native plants don't survive. Um, in many cases, they look wild and overgrown, and in other cases, they look weedy. If you, I've got a habitat garden, so you, you're not going to have a lot of clients asking you to install a garden like mine. It looks weedy, but I live in Berkeley, so the neighbors are okay with it. <laughs> um, and you know, there are, there are good reasons why some native plant gardens fail. Um, as I said, overwatering. Watering in summer is a big one. Some of these things really shut down for the summertime. Um, and they depend on the soil drying out to reduce the populations of fungi and other pests. And when you water during the summer, not only do you shock the plants, but you feed their enemies. Um, poor plant selection is a really big reason. I'm not sure who picked the, uh, this thing here. I think it might have found its own way in there. Um, zero maintenance is another problem. 
Um, these do require some maintenance. Just because native plant gardens are low maintenance doesn't mean that they're zero maintenance. And then lack of design is another big one. As you can tell, all of these are addressable problems. Maybe not for this garden. I suspect that that's just the way that place is going to be no matter what, ground, what you put in the ground. But, um, but we can get closer to this. And so the, the basic principles are that you need to plan for rain, and that means for the presence and the absence of it. You need to plant local. You need to plant correctly, plant right, get those things in the right locations and plant a little bit. Um, and you need to do maintenance. And I apologize for plant right. I understand that there's a plant right project that I'm actually on the steering committee of it. But, um, but that's part of planting right is not planting your invasive plants. Um, so as far as planning for rain, you want to take the opportunity to build in water features and rain capture and, and kind of landscape heterogeneity and use permeable surfaces and plan for when rain is going to come, you want to capture it and you want to move it down into the ground. Um, you want to stop it, slow it, spread it. Um, you, want, you want to plant in the fall so that you're making use of those late fall and winter rains and your native plants, which have evolved under that, wintering, that watering regime, can really establish their roots. And I've noticed that in that first year, many of these natives don't appear to really grow very much because they're putting all their biomass down below ground. They don't make as much biomass above ground. They are investing in below ground. And once they get good, deep roots that can access deep soil moisture, then they start to pay you back by growing above ground. Um, and then you want to water deeply and infrequently. So you don't want to water a little bit every day like you would a lawn. Instead, you want to water mimic the natural rain events. So you've got a day like today, and then you have a couple weeks of, of dry. And you can do that during the summer, too. We do have summer rain. We just don't have it every day. Um, and then you want to avoid regular. I can't remember what that says, so that's just kind of fun. I'm just <laughs> going to go with that. Um, yeah. So, and then you want to plant local. And there's a lot of benefits to this. You know, at a practical level, you want to plant the plants that you have been growing here without any maintenance for five million years. They're going to do better in general than something that's taken from a totally different regime. Um, they also are good for all the, other, all the other benefits that you get out of native plant gardens. Um, you, and including, well, I'll just go fast. Um, I think I need to speed up here. Um, but one important thing is that you don't want to plant invasive plants. That doesn't mean that you can only plant natives. There's tons, you know, most of our non-California plants are non-invasive and you don't need to avoid them. But there are some that are bad actors. And, you know, as with any kind of gardening, you don't plant the weeds. Um, and then you want to plant for success. You want to structure the things. You want to build hydro zones. My first few gardens um, were a total mess where I just stuck everything in together and I'd be overwatering the dry plants and underwatering the ones that like water. Um, and so you want to design carefully and we're growing the field of folks who can de design native plant gardens. You want to take into account shade, um, the natural soil moisture, location of walls that can capture water, um, all that kind of stuff. And then you want to, you really want to build it around a few good evergreen California foundation plants, those big ones that are really going to structure everything else and really think carefully about where those go and then work around there. And then you want to, you want to build it for maintenance. Um, as I said before, these gardens are not zero maintenance gardens, but they should be low maintenance gardens. And you want to make it possible to do maintenance on them um, in a thoughtful way um, that keeps them looking good, like the one on the right, not the one on the left. Um, and so um, just as a design tip, a lot of people, you know, the convention for native plant gardens is that they're going to look like the one that's in my front yard right now. Um, it's not true there. You can, as you guys all know, you can use any design aesthetic or style. Um, we've got the plants for it. With the most biodiverse flora in North America, one of the world's most diverse floras, we've got a plant for any need. And just in case you didn't, we've just spent 50 years hybridizing and creating new types. And so we've got them in California, um, and we're improving supply, supply and availability. Part of that improving supply and availability is building this CalScape operation. It's a plant finder that folks can use to find plants. Duh. Um, at any location, you can type in your address, zip code, city, and it'll give you a list of the plants, the California plants that grow there naturally. You can then sort that list by a variety of different factors. Which ones are good for pollinators? Which ones are drought tolerant? Which ones are bomb proof? We've got our bomb proof list. Which ones are recommended by your local CNPS chapter? Um, we have a bunch of tools that folks can then use to narrow down a list, add it to their My Plants list, and then it can tell them which nurseries in their area sell those plants. And so we're building this tool as a platform to support all of our partners doing this work, to help them find the plants that they need and buy them smoothly, and help the retailers have uh, an improved connection with, you know, an improved connection of supply and demand. 
Um, it's really pretty cool, and I, ex I hope you will come and check it out. Just to look at the Berkeley list, here's, here's some of the output. You can filter it by those different categories. You can use the advanced search to get really advanced. Um, there's all kinds of beautiful pictures in there that you can use for everything. Um, I'm going to go through Calscape fast because I know that you all will get online and check it out as soon as you're out of here. Um, but, and I do ask that when you check it out, click on the link you know, to provide feedback and give us any suggestions that you've got or any new ideas or any advice on how we can make this more useful to you or to your clients or to your partners. Um, here's a copy of the, the My Plant list. When you create an account, then you can start really curating things and you can set up lists for specific gardens, and we're adding more functionality to it over time. It's got pretty much whatever you need to be able to figure out what to grow and find who sells it, um, but we're gonna make it more useful for a variety of other projects. Here's a, here's a screenshot showing the nurseries that are listed in there. Um, each star shows a nursery, and again, we're continuing to populate that as we discover more nurseries that carry a substantial selection of natives. There's a lot of nurseries that are native plant nurseries, but there's a lot more nurseries that have native plants. And, um, and so we're growing that. We're also, at CNPS, we've got a garden ambassadors project where we've decided that part of what's missing in getting people to really make the step and adopt native plant gardens is, uh, is just that they need to talk to someone about it. We've got a lot of folks, basically it's a lot more fun to plant your garden than it is to, to talk about it. And so we've made a point of reaching out to folks who actually do want to talk about their gardens and give them the tools to be able to talk to their neighbors, lean over the fence, and actually explain what native plant gardening is, why they've chosen to do it, how they've done it, what plants they like, be ambassadors for the concept. And this is taking off pretty well. We're starting in Southern California. It's been, we've got support from the, the um, South Coast chapter around Long Beach to get this thing started. Um, but we've got more and more ambassadors joining in and other partner organizations and entities that want to kind of team with us to do kind of specialized ambassador things. And so this is only maybe six months old and already Kristen is completely swamped with it as it's growing. So keep this in mind, get in touch with us when you see a utility for this, or you see groups that would like to join, or just an individual who's got a great garden and can't shut up about it. So I think that's basically the end. I know I'm out of time. Um, I wanna save time for the great conversation that we're gonna have now. Thank you. Actually hand that over to the gentleman. Maybe you can make your way over to the... No worries. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, gravy. Hi, I'm Jennifer DeGraff. Um, that's me. Ryan made me add this right before the thing because I didn't have one. <laughs> um, I see so many familiar faces. Like, I think I've met half of you. Is there anyone who's not familiar with Wheelo? Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, because our time is abbreviated and we've got three people talking on three slightly separate areas of this stuff, um, I kind of focused on like the, the first, I think California Native Plants website could be the first place you go if you're looking for a plant list then I wanna show you the second step. And this is just what I'm doing my own workflow. So I'll explain that as much as I can as I go. Okay, so Woo Calls. If you know Mwilo, you probably know about Woo Calls. There's about 3,500 plants. There are six regions throughout California and they have little groups of experts sit down, discuss each plant and give it a factor, a plant factor, which says that that plant is low, very low, moderate, or high water use. And it's the only thing I know of presently, and it's only here in California, where we can take that judgment call of what the plant's water needs are and turn it into math for WELO, irrigation budgeting, and all that other stuff. So it's not perfect. I'm gonna show you an example of imperfection. Um, but it is pretty darn good. We're the only ones I know that have this, and then I, I kind of want to show you how to use it. So we're number one, region one. You go over there, you can see the little hand, click on north coast, or what is that, north central coastal, and then pull down to your city or the city closest or most like your city or the city you're working in. And, and then you can go from there to a whole database 
Before I get into this slide, I want to point out that on that plant list that you can pull up, you can search by all kinds of different things, just like the other site. But then there's an Excel spreadsheet you can, you can um, export to Excel after clicking the ones you like. So my workflow is now CNPS, find a bunch of plants I like, go through there, I can create an Excel spreadsheet, or vice versa, I could create an Excel spreadsheet of everything that's low water use, and then go to CNP, C, CNPS and, and find the ones I want and just start deleting lines. So you could work this back and forth depending on what your priority is, what your challenge is, is it hydrozoning or is it natives or what, and then you can go through them and kind of cross-reference them. So that plant factor I mentioned, let's just take low, for example. Low is 10% to 30% of ETO. Now ETO is a reference number that refers to heavily, heavily watered turf grass close by. And I'm just going to leave it there. So we're referring to that whole bunch of water. Let's say we've got a low water use plant. It needs 10 to 30% of that much water. So it's a baseline that starts at the top and goes down as opposed to building up. Um, these, the range is given so that you can use your professional judgment and the conditions of your site to determine where in that range will you fall. Is your, is your site a little on the shady, protected from wind side, and it's not necessarily quite so hot, not quite so you know, dry all the time? You could go on the lower end. Maybe you don't need to add as much water. If it's higher or exposed to wind or sunnier, hot, then you could go on the higher end and say, you know what, those plants are going to get all this influence. We're going to give them a little bit more, but they're still low water use plants. They don't just jump a factor because they're in a different spot. So that's what that's really about. Um, here's the search page. I should have put that first. Uh, so you can go in here. You can search by, I typed in aloe. You can search by names. I recommend searching by parts of names. Uh, and I'll, I think I'm going to show you that. Or you can search by plant type. You could just pull up a whole list that's just ground covers that are very low water use, splat. You're done. You have a whole list of just that. Um, but if you do it by plant name or part of plant name, so when I put in the word aloe, it'll bring up a whole bunch of aloes, also intergeneric hybrids like gaster aloe and hesper aloe, and then hesper aloe paraflora, salvia sinaloensis has A-L-O-E in it. I find this super, super useful though because sometimes I'm looking for something and it's not immediately apparent even when I've typed it in right. So I have looked for salvia confertiflora and not been able to find it. That's my favorite go-to um, can't find it plant. <laughs> and when you look for salvia confertiflora, you can find it under salvias, but good lord, the list is really long. Or you can put in confer and find anything else that has that and find it that way. But if you type the whole name in, it bugs out and you won't find your plant. So I, I highly recommend using the part of the name tactic to find your things. So when we're doing water budgets, I just wanted to cover kind of a really low hanging fruit factor. We're going to be working with water budgets. WELO references WU calls. And so this is the, the, at the moment, preferred database for finding out these plant factors. Then when you're crunching the numbers and you're trying to figure out what can I plant where and how much of it, you want to know to put your money where it's really going to get you something back. So if you need to use more water, like a moderate water use plant, or even, you know, I, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, a high water use plant, put it where it gets the most you know, return on investment. Put it in an entryway, a small, discrete, important area, in a pot, something like that. And then conserve water where you can, and that would be the conserve part. Bigger areas, larger expanses, stuff that's around the back that people aren't going to see um, as much or maybe not as close up. That kind of place is great for conserving water and keeping your plants hydrozone better. Um, I highly recommend when you're looking for plants, 
with the nursery trade and the sudden explosive interest in California natives, source them early. The nurseries need to know we're looking for them, and they need to know that so that they can keep producing more and more and more of them. So there's a reality check. I'm gonna go through this really quick because I'm also <laughs> running through time faster than I thought. Be aware of plant factors. There are, there are like schools of thought out there where people just go, oh, roses are high water use, this is this, that's that. It's not so. If you actually look them up, succulents, for example, I went, I went to some Sunset Western Garden magazines and found their top 10 drought tolerant, whatever. That, that can span three different plant factors. That is not necessarily hydrozoning. So I want to make a big distinction between drought tolerant and actually hydrozoned where you've got matching plant factors. Um, I threw a hissy fit about that. So when they post this, feel free to look that up. Um, I have a habit of doing that. This is a weirdness factor. <laughs> so if you're looking through Wilo, and I'm sorry, Woo Calls, and you have a plant that they don't specifically list because they will go down to the cultivar if they think it's important. Uh, and say you want Festuca siskiyou blue, very popular blue fescue. Woo Calls says it's a moderate water use plant. But if you look up the parentage, it comes from a low water use plant and a very low water use plant. I do not know why. So when the experts sit down and they talk about siskiyou blue specifically, they said this is a moderate water use plant, despite its heritage. So that's one of those things where maybe your judgment and looking things up cross-referenced with this will come up with something odd. And you could probably, in some places, make the case that your judgment is better than what they're saying, and maybe not. And I agree with Dan, low water use or any particular hydrozone is not a style. It doesn't have to look like Berkeley. You're making my argument for me. Um, it lay out, and us as designers, I'm a landscape architect, if we understand the plants, their forms, and their textures, we can use them to best effect. And I think, so far, there haven't been enough great examples of that, and so we get this, this uh, cachet that everything has to look like chaparral. Uh, I just have a couple photos on that that I'll kind of blow through. Uh, this particular one is in Italy, but I liked it. So all those plants, Iris germanica, bearded iris, uh, olive trees, juniper, cupressus, I couldn't quite make it out. They're all low, low water use, but it's definitely a formal garden. This is not a Berkeley wildscape kind of a garden. Um, and also I want to make you guys think a little more about form. So within a species, we can have dramatically different forms. Uh, we, we have dwarf plants, we have large statured plants, all within the same genus, often within the same species. And then there's nursery-made forms like grafted trees, that kind of thing. Um, and, and cultivar is huge. Acacia cognata, big honking tree. Acacia cognata, cousin it, little bitty bush. So <laughs> be careful. We, we don't want to be like, OK, I'm just going to use acacia cognata because it's drought tolerant. Da -da -da. And then we've got a you know, massive mess on our hands. Uh, Circus canadensis is easy for me to pick on. You can get them as a standard, like the guy on the left, or multis, like the guy on the right. They come like forest pansy, has purple foliage. They have fall color. It doesn't mean we're stuck just because we feel like we're being penned in by these plant factors. And then that's pretty much it for me. Thank you. Shall I mic him? Yes, thank you. I'm gonna go catch him. Stand still, I'm gonna get you. Well, we're going to do this first, then after we discuss, we can do that time. So. Yeah. Oh, wow. You are an advanced guy, so. Okay. Uh, let's see, I'll use this.
I don't know that I need to be over here, uh, but I did want you to see examples of a couple of trees from Mexico, Arizona that are particularly good about conserving on water, and they're not even on Wuckles. Wuckles doesn't know anything about these. So and Wuckles is an interesting little debate amongst people who have to assign them uh, places in the landscape in hydrozone. Because Wuckles is based on six regions in California. That's not enough to really assign properly the water use coefficient. It isn't. So it's the best we have now. We're, we're moving on. Nonetheless, uh, here's a Quercus hybrid, Undulata rugosa. Undulata rugosa is one of our best trees. It actually keeps leaves, they're pretty sizable leaves on, and makes a lovely plant 25, 30 feet high. And without almost any augment or augmentation of water after the second season. So pretty good deal. Uh, this little Quercus amarii over here is a nice one too, Arizona, and is a little more, as you might expect, a little scratchy looking, but nonetheless very, very lovely. And neither of these have sudden oak death issues. I have some trees over there that do. We like them very much, nonetheless, but anyway. So uh, today, uh, oh, look at that. Um, Uh, what I want to do today is very simple. I'm borrowing heavily, as I have done my entire teaching career, which is organized plagiarism, uh, which is all you do is you take the best and you get it, you gather it for your students. That's what you do. Whether it's yours or not, that's fine, but you just gather it so they can see it. Today, what I'm doing is completely online, completely downloadable, and patent trademark free. So you can do any of this. So everything you see here is completely available to you. So. So here are some, well, I want to start off, is today's topic is this root system issue. I'm having, I'm finding more evidence that there is more water savings to be gained by starting off with the right specimen versus just focusing on species and how much water they might be predicted to use. And we at Devil Mountain bring a lot of material in from Oregon. And big, big trees, roots have been cut. And then we recut the roots and encourage them to grow on in bigger containers for big projects. We also bring in trees like these from Oregon, Mexican trees grown in Oregon, as small plants and move them on and root prune at every stage in which they are grown. Every shift is root pruned. And we're, I'll show you what we're going for because this is all taken from the Urban Tree Foundation, Brian Kempf, Ed Gilman, people who preceded them, Dr. Harris at UC Davis, to put all these wonderful bits of information forward for the nursery industry to be able to produce better plants, not just more species. And it's very frustrating because Devil Mountain is moving very quickly and they're selling a lot of material and people just can't get enough plants. And boy, you know, quality starts to take a back seat after a while and you, we can't have that. So what I'm saying is that in this case, uh, most of the plants we bring in these days, I, I say all the plants we bring in these days, all go through the same protocol, having roots cut. And we'll get from this little little thing, which is online. Uh, by the way, Becky is here, who put this together for me. This is the first time I've ever talked with one of these in my life. So this is not you, this is unfamiliar ground. So if, you, if it looks a little crazy, it is. But nonetheless, the idea is to end up with a radial root exploitation from a single or singular root stock. In many cases, that's not what we have. We have nurseries which have taken a plant, transplanted several times without cutting any roots, and you have this lopsided root system. As well, in California, we use black polyethylene pots. So guess which side in a nursery the roots are growing on? North side. So south side, no roots. So in this case, we have to kind of take these plants out and cut root systems on a continual basis to be able to have a periphery, let's see, periphery, structural roots, and then become fibrous. Now, there's a bunch of really great reasons for this horticulturally. One is I can get a much bigger plant in a much smaller pot and sell it to you for a, at a job and still have a really good plant, a really good successful exploitative plant. Uh, I don't need nearly as much soil. We'll see why when I start showing the root systems, but nonetheless, it's a wonderful plant. It establishes much better. And again, it's two or three cycles of seasons, and you are stepping away from the plant, and that plant's on its own. Since we want for our kids, we want to be able to give them what they should have, 
be able to not hover, but to move back and let them eventually take flight. And this is what root systems can do that are well raised. This happens to be bald and burlap types. Many plants we receive these days are B and B to start. We unwrap those plants and we put them in new pots. But as we do it, we cut the heck out of those root systems. So we'll go ahead. Here's a containers. You've all seen this before. We have roots that have gone to the side of the container, have been circled around. They, they love it. They're just searching for water. They have to follow the container they're in. They go to the bottom. What I have over here, for anybody who wants to look at, I've taken the bottoms off many root systems over here. So you can see these little, these little slices of bologna, if you will, that have nothing but roots that are congested and dead. Have no value to the plant at all. And that's what happens when you have oxygen starvation. And that's what happens in containers where the roots now dominate the volume versus the soil. You'd like to have a nice ratio of air and water, media and roots. And in the case of these root-bound specimens, or not even root-bound, just kind of getting there, you have the wrong ratio started already. So the idea is that you want to buy uh, plants in this pretty small form. And when, you, when you're shopping amongst trees, in this case, this is the main object of this talk, you'd like to shop smaller trees because you have a better pick. If you begin to choose the, as an architect or designer, you begin to pick specimens of plants that are 24, 36, 48 inch or, or bigger boxes, you're looking at leftovers. Those are all leftovers. Those that didn't get sold before. So what I'm saying is you need to be there at the beginning versus at the end. You can still shepherd those along. And so Devil Mountain has a big program too as a result of growing, growing plants on for people uh, and doing it the right way. Big job. So here's... Here's what it looks like if you go online. Here it is. And this is all specifications for nursery tree quality. And here is the, uh, here's the publication. So I, here's the front page of it. Here's what it looks like. So you can go online and get this from Urban Tree Foundation. You can have the whole set yourself. And there are many hundreds of pages. So, but what we have here is our root systems have confounded themselves. And wood, as we know, when wood begins to form, and the pericycle tissue, which is in roots, begins to form, if there's a kink in it, that's the way it is forever. It doesn't. It never goes back. It can't straighten itself out. Wood is just that persistent. And in fact, many plants you will find inside the bigger root ball that you're paying for, you'll find the actual root system. And it's already confounded. This is of no value. This is a plant that has to... I, I can't spend the time to reconstruct this plant. It's compost. So you can't, you can't waste your time. So here's what liners, a lot of plants start off in liner stages and they go and they have nice root systems. That's fine. But here, we're, again, we're finding the congestion of roots at the bottom need to be cut off. You got to start again. You got to loosen those roots, which is what's happened over here. I got a couple of maples over here, a couple of oaks. I'm sure, the same things happen with all those plants. You think, oh, what a nice life they are going to have. Well, they're not. Unless they get cut. So, so here it is. What we're looking for is the distribution of roots. And we'll just go through this. But you can see that here, we have those which are fibrous, uniform throughout, probably been pruned. Up here, we've got big, big ba basic scaffold or lateral roots here that have not been pruned. And as a result, we have this congestion of big roots that, again, have bent, and they're never going to go out and exploit soil around and become drought tolerant. The worst thing you can have is a small plant that's staying in one spot. It's bigger and bigger in one spot. And then we, we attend a tree failure conference every year, and a lot of times the tree failure reports that come in are trees, trees, because they had a root system this big. So what happens when you cut these even big roots, and I cut roots on these trees that are 12, 15 feet high, we get in, the caliper is about four inches. We cut roots about this far from the trunk that are two inches in diameter. Oh my gosh, it's never gonna live. They live just fine. And in fact, the nice benefit of this, that this root, when it does grow out, is never gonna lift that sidewalk. It's not gonna break that infrastructure. I'm going to take the driveway apart. So there's a lot of reasons to do it well. And go to here's here's some when it just didn't get transplanted soon enough, so it's too congested with roots, even if they are fibrous, too congested. Should have been out of the pot a long time ago. Here's a root system we're kind of going for. Going for this a trunk and then well served secondary roots. Secondary roots, there are no nodes in the root system. They have just little tissues that produce that poke out from existing tap roots, secondary roots. So they have a different way of going. And you can feel free to take a scissors and make it uniform again before you pile it up again. Do that. That's just fine. Here's one I was, uh, my, my, my partner was having her knee replaced. 
at the Kaiser Surgery Center in San Leandro. I was wandering around as nervous energy will. Here's a, here's a nice alder tree, and you can see that no one ever uh, they put a quality uh, standard uh, for selection of plants. So, and you can see it, what it would have been. It's about realizing potential. This information here is just based on what I'm going to show you here, is just how to grow trees, how you should be accepting them, what standards you should have for them. And in fact, it is maintaining a straight trunk. But you found out in your own lives, it's easy to get wide. It's, you want to start out, <laughs> you start out tall, and then you can go wide. You don't start off wide, that's a life, that's a tough life. So, my, my, so here we are. And we are giving them these uh, kind of radical treatments here. So I'm just saying that here are two that are started off just the right way. They're going to have a nice life doing what they're going to do. We started them up straight first, and we have subordinated all these branches so that they're not conflicting or competing with the trunk. That's you. We have to have one leader. Every relationship is like that, too. You have to think about who's going to do that. You don't start off the same place and do the same things because you become divergent and weak and you break. That's, that's, that's it. That's the... Yeah, so here we go from, from trees like this to trees like this, from trees like this to trees like this. Same here. So people, oh, we get more trees this, more tree this way. No, you're not getting more tree. You're getting a weaker tree. Well, you have to, this is what you want. And for almost every species, it doesn't even matter. It's a starting point. And then once you have that starting point going, you're fine. So what I have over here are examples of trees that have temporary laterals. Okay? So you can see going from here to here. It's not difficult stuff. I wish it were really complicated. We'd have an excuse for not doing it. So, unfortunately, we don't have an excuse. So, that's it. Oh. I will, I will. Yeah, actually, would you put, turn that picture back on? If you don't mind, if you would explain to me, because I, I don't understand that last, the bottom picture, what is it I want to be looking for and doing correctly here? Yeah, I'll repeat the question. What, what is wrong with this, and why do we want to go this direction? Well, it's a good point. We have scaffolding of plants that are strong and versus weak. We can see that trees later on that have this, in which this has competed with these or competing with that in a point where, in a, in a place where they're actually the same size. These crotches begin to include bark. They begin to, all both of them be, pretend to be trunk. And in trying to be trunk, you begin to push away from each other. Again, we don't want plants at this point, at this point because it's too juvenile. Hormones way too juvenile here. These grow very quickly against each other and they begin to push each other away. We'd like to have a radial root system, or excuse me, a radial branch system that has the plant not competing with itself. I don't want one trunk here with several trees going on. and I just, They just shade themselves out. And now I have an inefficient, inefficient tree. Uh, over here, we have kind of restored some of that. We've taken some of the height of these out. And over here, I have a few to prune if we want to spend time after or some other time. I could go through and prune and show you how to subordinate branches. It's very simple. But anyway, that's the point. This is just, yeah. That's great, Stuart. Yeah. Because we're here. You have, to, uh, you have to talk into that, sir. Would, the, uh, would this apply both to fruit trees and ornamental trees? It does to me. It does. It does apply to both trees. I mean, some people, we, you go to the nursery. I used to do that same person trying to shock people back in the 60s in the nursery and just, you want this apple tree here? You go, and you give it a cut down about two feet from the, from the ground. And, oh, so, oh, you want the branches to come out? Well, that's passe. That was when we had a male-dominated horticulture system. <laughs> Look around you today. So the point is that we now have a system that says, oh, yeah, let's think first. And... Uh, so the plants have their own Me Too movement? Is that what yeah, you're saying? So what, yeah. What, yeah. So what's happening now at Devil Mountain, I don't want to, this is not an uh, infomercial, but the fact is we are growing Japanese maples this way. We're growing fruit trees this way. 
They have dominant leaders. They have strong subordinate branches. They can become anything this direction you want. And it's really not about height and picking anymore. You're, you're making many more fruitful places, flowering places in a nice range. You're getting a miniature tree without it being some kind of odd miniature tree with scaffold limbs that spread in your way and become weak and sunburned. So Let's move to our next uh, question on this side of the room, especially for um, hopefully your question might be for yeah, about yeah, some people. Uh, actually, it's not, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you, um, yeah, let's spread it around. Um, you just made a comment about how the root pruning would result in the trees not lifting the sidewalk. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because I didn't quite understand. Well, what? again, in the case of plants that we get in from other nurseries that are big or plants that even developed in a container over time, the bigger that root system is in its caliber, the more oomph it's going to have as it does eventually spread out and gets under something, and then that increment diameter gets big. When I've already cut that, now I've diffused it, not in, now it's no longer one scaffold root. It's now several, and probably 30. And I have the pictures from a pruning workshop we did about three weeks ago in a ginkgo, which is not known for the speediest thing. A root was a, almost two inch in diameter, had been cut before we ever got it. And so we were able to show, we got, here's a crew, we we're looking at, wow, the roots, there were about 40 roots about this long out of that cut, all the way around, like a broom. It's exactly what you want. Those are all great feeders and are getting much more food opportunities than that root would have. It just went out in the, so I say you can have a bigger plant and a smaller pot. That's a, oh. Um, so this is for Dan. Dan, I was hoping that you would share with people some native garden tours that are coming up. In case they wanted to see some beautiful native garden. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so so it's the season for native plant garden tours and wildflower shows. Are folks from the Bay Area or South Bay or, yeah, okay. Santa Clara Valley Chapter has a fantastic garden tour. I believe it's, maybe Kristen can help me if I'm wrong on the dates. I, yeah, 7th and 8th. I think they're basically all kind of <laughs> April 7th and 8th or the weekend after. We've got them in Santa Clara Valley chapter all over. Um, East Bay Bring Back the Natives Garden Tour is, I believe, in May. Kathy Kramer does that one. It's fantastic. May 6th. Obviously, I don't have the dates memorized, <laughs> but we've got them for you. Um, and if CNPS chapters don't have them, then our partners do. Just go to cnps.org and there's a calendar and you might find some other stuff there as well. CNPS.org, California Native Plant Society. Where are those project-specific questions we were hearing so much about at the beginning of this session? Please. Okay, I, I guess this is... I have a tree that I planted last year from Devil Mountain Nursery, and <laughs> it's leaning. Got a, got a ringer, huh? Wasn't a 24-inch pot. And I do want it to be drought tolerant. Oh. Well, not having had a look at it, I don't know. I, it's hard to say. What species Should I post it? I want to say it's a native plant, but it's not. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's just we treat all plants the same. Olive. What? Olive tree. Olive, okay. That's what olive my standard. wanted. Aleo, yeah, Europa. Okay. All right. Well. I'll have to schedule a little appointment, I guess, for you. I mean, you can't even well, answer so things that happen there in the century. Leaning, is there anything? Do we want to do a post? Sure. Yeah, we, 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 we will do a, a technique of using these here. Technique of, of course, putting stakes out here away from the trunk, away from scaffold limbs, allowing a loose enough tie to allow that plant to move around. And, uh, and that would be enough guidance for it to get root system. might be a year or two, and then off they go, and they're fine. It's just difficult to know from this point exactly what it would be. Yeah. Question in the back. Yes, for uh, low water use trees, um, do you guys do you recommend um, a drip system or a hen water uh, when you're trying to establish the roots of the low water use? Okay. Yeah, you Hi, Hector. Um, 
<laughs> so I, I get to sort of be the interstitial space between design and, and irrigation and a whole bunch of things, so I will do my best. Um, I know Scott's in the audience also, and he has opinions about this that I'm about, or he was, that I'm about to repeat. If you go to some native plant nurseries, their websites will say that native plants, are you talking about natives in specific? in particular, or just large statured trees? Sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, I messed you okay, up. Okay, I don't remember all these low water trees that I have on the property, but one yeah. of them is uh, Cerces occidentalis, okay. and I um, was advised by a, by a non-profit to hand water uh, five gallons of right. water uh, once a week uh, for a year. Okay. For establishment. I get and it. And then I have other low water use trees that I am watering it, uh, just by uh, drip system. Okay, I get it. Um, oh boy, that's a couple different things. What we want to do for any tree is teach it to fish. We want it, don't just give it a little water frequently so that it, it lives right where you're watering. You want to water it so that it can establish farther roots, farther afield, more of them, deeper roots, and all that sort of thing. And, I, and, and I'm sure these two will correct me if I do this wrong. <laughs> but if you just put bubblers at the base of the tree and walk away, that would be not helping this tree to fish. So one thing um, that you should probably be doing is growing the system, making sure that um, as as it's getting established and you're trying to make sure that the root ball itself that came out of a pot or a burlap bag um, is, is getting the water, you need that water to be in that root ball, not just nearby, because we've got to get those roots to actually go and start exploring and get out there. They're not going to explore towards water that they don't know about. So we definitely need to encourage them to go farther and farther each time which means that for your plant, when you get advice like this many gallons, this, this often, it leaves out what's actually going on with the plant from a moment to moment or day by day basis. Is it hot out? Is it raining? Should I, should I be putting the water here or there? And how long has that plant been in the ground? Some will establish an overcome moving day more readily than others will. And so it's going to take a little bit more. You, I, I, I love Stu, but I don't actually treat all my plants the same in that I want to know how that tree's doing. If I have three of the same species, same cultivar in a row, one might get a little more wind and maybe need a little more encouragement, or another might be in a slightly shadier spot for some reason and need a little bit less. So I like to really, for my own projects and my own um, workflow, my own garden, is pay attention to that tree in that spot and see how that tree's doing. And then you can always do a little exploratory digging and see if there's little finger roots coming out and doing their thing. But I, I you can use Wukals to calculate how much. And you, if anyone's familiar with Lori Palmquist, she has the Water Wonk website. You can go to her website and, and calculate it uh, species nonspecific just by plant factor, and it'll tell you how many gallons. Um, so hopefully I answered that question. Yeah. yeah. I'd like each of our panelists to talk about the things you observe in other gardens, not your own, um, either public or private, that you find most uh, troublesome or irritating or annoying or that really kind of get at you. Is it like invasives or do, no, one, 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 one item each and I want succinct answers. So what is the one thing that sort of drives you nuts when you look at other gardens? Succinct answers, please. Yeah, and just kind of like instant answer um, instant. without yeah, yeah, thinking yeah. about it a lot. I think just lost opportunity. And you know, a lot of those gardens, you know, Pull the that bad closer, gardens Dan. that I show. Yeah. Lost opportunity. Um, folks, you know, it's fine if folks aren't gardening and if, you know, weeds are coming up, that's fine. But if you're gonna put time into it, there are, if, if you put a little bit more time into selecting things that really have multiple benefits, you can really have a lot of, you can do a lot of change. And um, and the whole kind of like, oh, well, this thing's sprouting. I'll break it off and stick it here. And you just wind up with an aloe yard or something. So you see a lot of those. And um, I think it's time for a revolution in that. If I were, you know, if I were in the in the nursery industry, I would be trying to promote people to do 
whatever kind of new garden because there's a lot of old bad landscapes out there that are going to get pulled out and you want to be the one selling the replacements. And I think it's a I think all of us need to do gardening. We need to connect. Not just the people in this room, but the people out there yelling at each other need to spend some time with some dirt. <laughs> and I think if we have a movement to redo our gardening, I think there's going to be a lot of benefit for everybody. Good times. Go ahead. Well, I was debating. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. This is going to be tough. Oh. Is this, is this good? Okay. okay, is it right? Okay, good. It's... Um, I don't know how to say is this. the one thing that drives you crazy? This is the There's too many. I'm so eager for an answer here. Well, uh, well, well, number one is walking by landscapes, again, lost opportunities, but we've put in plants that are really you know, they're appropriate, appropriate for the SPED setting. They're failing, making the industry look bad, every professional look bad, the nursery, the producers, all of the architects of designs make everybody look bad. Also, the level of decadence that we, we allow in our plants. We allow a plant to grow up and not look so great and just kind of keep it going uh, as though a bare branch is here, a bare branch there is fine. Pretty soon the whole landscape looks a little more unlive than alive. And they get the reputation that we get and using a variety of species, particularly natives, really kind of goes downhill a bit. And just to see this level of decadence as a result of the soil they're in being too heavy and the amount of water that that soil holds being too much allows a lot of plants that are actually used to holding off in shallow, thin, coarse, non-nutritive soils, they don't know what to do with this new soil, so they don't look very good. So it's a, it's a, it's a, always happens. This, and we constantly do. We have lots of great plants to use. We can, like Ben says, try to use them in the right spots. In fact, they can actually have a chance. And I've changed a lot of my ideas over the period. I used to drove in the 70s, grew plants from Native Plant Society, and Thought, oh, this is great. Well, I was only seeing them in what? Kindergarten, second grade, maybe a high school. We don't have any pictures here showing senior centers of plants. We don't have that setting where we're actually seeing what plants become, how fantastically good they can be. A lot of them don't live that long. And we, there's no real, no reason for it other than just a lack of education. So. Good answer. Yeah, mine is a lot like those. Oh, so many things bug me. But um, <laughs> but I would say, it, now granted, I'm a landscape architect. I went to school to be an artiste, right? Um, and I think design is one of the best tools we have to communicate with. However, when that design takes the place of good decision making and knowledge of the plant material or the soil health or how to properly grow something when it's only based on color or big fluffy pictures and close-ups of flowers. That just drives me nuts because it demonstrates that people don't actually know what they're talking about and how it grows. They're just selling some colors and it that kind of bugs me. Yes. Real quick, if I can say one more, I think that we have a, a need for maintenance. I think we're in native plants, we're doing really good with design, availability, and installation is getting good. Um, but I think across the board, not just for natives, but I think maintenance is a weak link in gardens. And there's a lot of folks out there, you know, doing, <laughs> getting paid for maintenance and not doing a great job of it. Okay, now you did it. <laughs> yeah. Open the floodgates, buddy. So if you're concerned with maintenance, go up and talk to the ladies at the Rescape California table because we do whole trainings on that. Um, yeah, I have a question regarding, um, I don't know who would answer this best, but uh, you know, when you set up the irrigation controller schedule, um, you set July as the most irrigated month which is inverse to your native plants. Right. So, d and usually how we do it is we do it just, okay, give it a lot of water uh, once or, or every other week or something like that during the establishment period um, or, cut it, or cut it off, I guess. Uh, but um, questions on that. And then two is WELO requires uh, four cubic yards per 1,000 square feet of organic matter in the soil. And a lot of native plants don't like that much organic matter. Yeah, okay, I'll try both. Let's, let me start with the compost one because I've already forgotten the other question. Uh, <laughs> okay, four we'll cubic yards per thousand square feet or five to six percent as is shown in your soil sample and your soil testing 
if you're doing natives, this is going to come down to a conversation with your enforcement agency. How are they interpreting that? Can you argue them out of such heavy composting? Um, some will say, yeah, we understand that your palate doesn't require this. We're cool with that. Others don't get it, and they'll require it, or they'll do all kinds of weird stuff, and then you'll end up with that much compost anyway. And remind me real this quick. Uh, the maximum irrigation is in set in July. Oh, July. Okay, so this is one of those places where I think it's a hole. It's a rule of thumb to set your baseline for your high ETO um, in July, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you have to do. It's also usually done so that you have a different uh, schedule for establishment than for uh, established plants. And so uh, in, in scheduling, God, I am not the right person to lecture on scheduling, but uh, in scheduling, you could go in and control the controller. Don't just set it and forget it. And I think that knowing their palate, knowing what your plants need, and understanding that comes far more into play. It's harder because you've got to start learning irrigation and uh, going down that road. And there's a lot of information. There's a lot to learn. Um, but I do think the set it and forget it and just following th rules of thumb doesn't necessarily always work. Oh, Scott, you are here. <laughs> yeah, I would just add that um, uh, a lot of times native plants are actually a, another hydrozone that we don't think about because uh, they've developed in a time when they get all their water and do a lot of their growth in the springtime. And they actually go dormant, some, some of them, or they, they don't need as much water in, in, in June. So, right. so it's, it's just a matter of um, putting those plants on a separate hydrozone. Native plants are low water use plants. Other Mediterranean plants are low water plants. But some plants that do all their growing in the springtime, right. we, uh, we've really got to expand our idea of what a hydrozone is to, to a native plants. Yeah, I completely agree with Scott. It's challenging, though, because it's fun to mix and match. And I want to put this with this with this. And, and, and then if I start going way down the road and, and studying, when is their active growth season? And how am I going to irrigate that and all that other stuff? It gets complicated pretty quickly. So uh, we have a hand from somebody who's asked a question. Um, others, uh, before I move the microphone up here, or, or does Dan, and do you want to add to what was already discussed there? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I guess I could, yes. Um, it's, it's very perplexing. If you really get into native plants, you really understand habitats, soil types, succession, seasons, soils. It's tough because if you're talking about a plant that's ordinarily in this soil that's just non-nutritive, coarse, well-drained, well aerated, that's a plant you're not irrigating in July or putting one in at that time. However, the plants that are deciduous, which are the plants that take thicker soils and less infiltration rate, can go in in, in summer any, just any time. It's fine. So you have to make a distinction between the kind of habitat you're trying to represent at what time of year in terms of installation. Maintenance. It's a huge difference between success and failure. Now you rear, there, there aren't that many plants you can actually put in in the summer that are from very dry regions that will succeed. succeed. And I've seen a few, surprisingly, it shocked me, but not that many. And so that, that as a period of time when you add water to a already moist or already a hot soil, you have the water molds that take out most of the native plants, some plants that the, the organisms they're not used to seeing in the summer at all. And that's, that's, that's kind of the tough part. So I think we haven't even addressed what a proper planting site is for a native, what the proper planting site is to put in a tree or a shrub to make astounding differences in success, uh, no matter what season you're talking about. So that's something that would be a discussion we have. Oh, yeah, oh gosh, yes. This Orphan Tree Foundation has got it all. It's got the size of pits. It's got the pedestals. It's got the size. It's got the berms. How to plant right, plant high, the whole thing. But how do we also do it with the right root system? Yeah, he, he's, he's done a great job. Um, yeah, so one other uh, idea uh, for the website um, is active growing time. Because, yeah, because knowing when to plant when and when to prune is very difficult for native plants. And if you come from any other part of the country, think, oh, you, you know, you prune in the fall when it loses all leaves. Maybe, maybe it's frost tender. I know you probably want to wrap up, but I, I just want to no, say no, that, no. you know, to a certain degree, native plant gardening is still kind of 
gurus are a big thing, and it's nice to see that we're moving to where we've got maybe fewer gurus and more gardeners. And it's pretty great to be in this room full of folks who are actually doing this stuff and, um, and, and really pushing the frontiers maybe without even documenting it or knowing it. So I just want to say keep going it. Are you guys all the CNPS members? Do you, uh -huh. do you, yeah, uh -huh. probably a marketing resource. Do you give, do you, when you have clients who are like into native plants or something, do you tell them about CNPS? I would like to, I would like to engage you and give you what you need to be able to do stuff better and in doing so grow the larger community. So if you, um, email me at dan at cnps.org if you're interested in something like that where we can give you something to give to your clients um, that kind of improves your ability to communicate with them and also grows the larger community of folks connected and pushing this thing forward. So it's worth noting the California Native Plant Society has a booth, Rescape has a booth, and Devil Mountain, who's with, uh, Stuart's with Devil Mountain, has a booth. And at Stuart's booth, I'm sure you'll be happy to talk about root systems. <laughs> and um, in fact, he may do a root cutting demonstration, right? So are there any questions before we wrap up? Okay, last, this is the final question. I know this is a tremendous amount of pressure. So I hand this over. Irrigation of natives uh, post-establishment. Some people say, oh, just rip out the irrigation system, they'll be fine. What are your experiences and recommendations? Yeah, they might be. It depends on the site, the soil, the plants, the summer. Um, they definitely require less water. Um, I think you, yeah. <laughs> it depends. It depends. Is your mic on? Doesn't sound like it anymore. Here. Oh, okay, great. Ooh, it works. Um, if you are in Interior Valley, uh, people who know what they're doing do water Arctosaphilus shrubs in the summer, about three times. You'll lose them otherwise. Uh, the ground cover types, which are all from the coast, not so much. And this is what we've run into here with a, a selection of native plants that are primarily from the coast. In fact, a selection of plants from other Mediterranean climates that are essentially from the coast being grown by coastal nurseries. There's not a lot of education there. There's not a lot of width, bandwidth there. You gotta realize that when you're starting to plant interior valleys, Santa Clara Valley and these are, you have a whole different ballgame and your job now is way different. You have to be much more abiding by the seasons. By the way, I want to point out who somebody asked about pruning. If you're having to prune your native plants, look in the mirror. you got a problem. You can't seem to get away from watering. These are plants that shouldn't need, shouldn't be producing superfluous growth. If they're producing superfluous growth, you're not using them as natives. You're using them as something else. So try to work, work it around so, in fact, you aren't adding to the profile water that the plant doesn't obviously need. So. This is helpful. So great questions. Um, I want to help uh, ask you to help me thank our panelists for their <laughs> expertise. <laughs> so really enjoyed the session. You know, one of the things I would actually like feedback on that you can think about when you get your survey uh, monkey from USGBC is uh, these workshops are sort of intended to be this sort of discussion uh, format. If you like that, where there's more time for Q&A than a typical uh, lecture, then let us know. Um, if you don't, if you'd like to be lectured to for an hour, let us know that too. Um, so we got a couple of quick announcements. Um, the sessions, there's one last round of presentations uh, that will take place in all the rooms. I know in this room there's a charrette on water reuse in the Conference Center, there's urban a presentation on urban trees with Joe McBride from UC Berkeley. And upstairs, it is eluding me. Um, lawn conversion, thank you. Of course, Jessica is, is, is hosting a session on lawn conversion upstairs. How could I forget? So uh, more great information. Uh, door, door prizes will be drawn at 530. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for attending. <laughs>